to uh, help you out. Uh, we are going to study God's Word together today because that's what we gather to do. We're continuing in 1 Peter. So we're in chapter 1 of 1 Peter, verses 17 through 21. And as we jump into the text this morning, let me just start by saying something that you, most of you all already know, is that like in life in general, motivation matters, Right? How many of you have ever tried to start like a diet and exercise program? Raise your hands. Come on. Come on. Be pr- there we go. See, you're not the only one. Now, how many of you have ever like failed and faltered at that exercise program? Same hands. Back up. Good. Right? And again, there, there's solidarity here. You're not the only one that's tried and failed over and over again every January. Right? If you've tried some sort of a diet and exercise program, you know, motivation matters. Some of you have those Apple watches. Right? And so your motivation is that you, you like invite your friends into your misery and you decide you're going to have a diet and exercise program and you're going to compete against all of these other people with the Apple Watch and then together you are going to like commiserate with each other and, and, and so you guys try to motivate each other um, to, to do a better job and to make sure that you do your exercises and that's why like when one of you exercises at 11 p.m., and then the other person sees that, and their day is almost over, and they haven't exercised, then they're up doing push-ups at 11.45 p.m. because they're not going to let you beat them before that day's over, right? Some of us, our motivation comes by way of competition. And competition, like, just motivates you. You're that person who is like, I'm not going to be outdone. I'm not going to be made better than. I will win. And competition just motivates you. Others of us are those kinds of people that the to-do lists motivate them, right? Accomplishment, checking things off of the list are things that motivate some of us. Others of us, fear motivates us. Many different things motivate us in life, but we understand that motivation matters. Motivation is really important. Needless to say, the same is true in the Christian life. If you've been a Christian for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you know that sometimes it's hard to be motivated to live the way that God called you to live, to do the things that God's called you to do, to not do the things that God has said not to do, to develop that relationship with God. That takes important motivation. So as we've come to 1 Peter chapter 1, last week we ended our time with, with these words in verses 15 and 16. It said, but as he who called you is holy... So also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you've been doing this Christian thing for any time at all, you realize that be holy like God is holy is not always easy. Amen? Right? Sometimes that is difficult. Sometimes just getting out of bed in the morning requires motivation. So to get out of bed and live for Jesus is like, I need extra motivation. What I love about 1 Peter is that there are more commands in 1 Peter per capita than there are in any of the other books in the New Testament. He's always giving us, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this. But he's always sprinkling in these motivations. And so today we're going to see some motivations for living the holy life. Some things that should really motivate us and excite us about living the life that God has called us to live. And we'll be in 1 Peter 1, verses 17 through 21. And I'll give you three of them, and I'll put them up on the screen. But let's pray as we dig into God's Word and ask that He would uh, just uh, enlighten our time together. Father, we are thankful that we have a Bible that we can put on this podium, and we can open it up, and that we can talk about that, and not just about... Uh, the next self-help thing that will motivate us or the next uh, motivational quote that will get us moving or anything like that, Father, that that we can be motivated by your word this morning. So I pray for my friends who are here today who are Christians, whether they call this church home or whether they have another church home and they're just here visiting, that they would be motivated from your word today. And Father, if that person is here who is just uh, checking out church and checking out Jesus and Christianity Um, that today maybe would motivate them to continue along that spiritual journey. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would empower my words with power that they don't have just coming from my mouth, um, but that they would have your power as they land on the hearts of your people, and that we would be strengthened, encouraged, edified, uh, built up, and challenged today. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's talk about motivation matters. The first piece of motivation we're going to see from this text is reverential fear of your father and judge. 
That's the first thing that's going to motivate us to live holy is a reverential fear of our Father, our Heavenly Father, and judge. And the passage says this in verse 17. It says, And if you call on Him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. I want to unpack a few things related to that verse. The first is right up there at the beginning. It says, if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each person's deeds, Peter here uh, lays out two important aspects of God, of God's rule. He talks about God as father, and he talks about God as judge. We all love it when scripture talks about God as father, Right? Jesus said, pray our Father which art in heaven. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, uh, which one of you being an earthly father, if his his child asked for him a gift, would give him a bad gift? He said, "Your, your heavenly Father loves to give good gifts. As we talk about God as Father, we're talking about his love for us, his fatherly love and affection and care. We're talking about his fatherly protection. If you've had a child, a young child, you know, requires certain amounts of love and protection. And then as they get older, more love and protection. And I find myself as my daughters start to enter into those teen years, becoming more and more and more protective. Amen, dads? There we go, right? Because they need that protection. And as a good dad, like, that's just inherent within me. My daughter comes home and she's like, a boy talked to me. And I'm like, no, they didn't. What's his name and his cell phone number? right? And I just inherently want to protect my girls. And now there's sometimes, and I probably, I, I got to admit, they'll probably say amen. I get a little overprotective. Easy, right? Yeah, but it's because I want to protect them, and I want to show that because as a father, that's just part of, of what's inherent in my character as a, a dad. That's part of God's love for us, God's fatherly protection of us. A father gives good gifts. God answers prayer according to his will. We see that when we talk about God praying to God as father. He's called Abba. Some people say that that means he's called daddy. There's an affection there. As a father, God does what is best, not necessarily what we want, right? As any good father will tell you, God as Father does, always does what is best, but not always what we want. And we've talked about this often here at PCBC, is that good fathers don't always give their kids what they want. They always give their kids what they need. And as earthly dads, we want to be good dads, even if our kids don't think we're being very good dads, because we're giving them what they need, not necessarily what they want, Right? They want unfettered internet access. We know they don't need unfettered internet access. They want complete opportunity to be online whenever they want, 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, whatever. We know that they don't need that, and they shouldn't have that. And so as good fathers, we stand up and do what is right. But all my friends have this social media. All my friends have that thing. All my friends are doing this and watching that and doing that. But as a good father, I know that that's not what's best for you. In the same way, God as Father knows what is best for us. He doesn't always give us what we want. He gives us what we need. And so when Peter is going to talk to them and and he's saying, if you call on him as Father, we don't understand the fatherly nature and character of God. Because then that next word, that frames the next word. He says, if you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. We love to think about God as Father when we get what we want from Him and ask anything that we want from Him. We don't often like to think of God as judge. And I want us to think about that for a minute today. Scripture is replete, Old and New Testament, with God as judge. And here are two important pieces to frame that. God's judgment is always just, and it always comes from God's holiness. So there's a link from verses 15 and 16 to verse 17. When we think about God as judge, that's unpopular today. That's not uh, build your church kind of language, right? That's not church growth language. That's not health, wealth, and prosperity language, but it is biblical language. He says, if you call on God as Father who judges impartially according to each person's deeds, we need to understand that we have a loving Heavenly Father who knows and understands how to rightly and justly judge 
his children and by extension judge all people God's judgment is an intrinsic part of his character right it's who God is and here's why that's important 21st century American Christians because everybody out there knows that God is what God is blank love oh pastor Steve if you just pray that We'd have to go to two services, three services, build new buildings. God is love. God loves everybody. All are loved. All are welcomed. All are affirmed. All can do whatever they want. We just want to be happy together because God is love. God is love. But God is unloving and unjust if God does not judge. We could spend a lot of time unpacking that. We won't today. But I would stand here before you and argue that when a church proclaims that on, God is only love, meaning you can do whatever you want, that's the most unloving thing that any pastor can proclaim to any congregation. Because it's the same thing as if I just tell my girls, well, there are no rules, there are no standards, there's no, ex- what, you kind of do whatever you want, I, I just foster that in you. Is that loving to them? Absolutely not. That is absolutely setting them up for failure. So when scripture talks about God as father and God as judge, we have to understand that those are both intrinsic and important pieces of how he relates to us and how we relate to him. We know that God as judge provides temporal judgment, right? Hebrews talks about discipline. If you're not disciplined, then are you really a son? Are you really a child of God? And that there's a judgment in that way temporally. Uh, We also understand that some of the things that happen both collectively and individually are God's judgment on people. We also understand that not only temporal, but there's a final eternal judgment. The Revelation teaches there's something called the great white throne judgment for unbelievers, where they'll stand before God and give account for their lives. We also realize that 2 Corinthians teaches that there's something that we call the bema, the judgment seat, where Christians will stand before God at the end times and give account for their lives. And 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 10 says we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We will stand before God as judge. The just judgment of a holy and righteous God should motivate us. That should be part of our motivation. Now look at the second half of verse 17. It says, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Typically what happens is that when we think of the word fear, a few things come to mind. When we think of fearing God, we usually think about the Old Testament, right? In the Old Testament, God was like scary and warrior and man, like he did some crazy stuff. But in the New Testament, God is love and kind and happy and a father. Realize that in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are references all over scripture of fearing God. And fearing God being a good thing. Proverbs, for example, in Proverbs chapter 1, Proverbs chapter 10, both we talk, we hear and we talk about the fact, I'm sorry, Proverbs 1 and Proverbs 9, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and it's the beginning of wisdom. I want to have knowledge, I want to have wisdom. It starts with properly fearing the Lord. In the New Testament, you hear about it in places like Acts chapter 5, when the church is just starting and uh, a couple of people, Ananias and Sapphira, come in and they lie to not only to people, but they lie to the Holy Spirit and jeopardize the purity of the church. There's judgment for them, and then it says specifically that the fear of God came over the church, and that was a good thing because the fear of God protected the purity of the church. All throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, we can talk about the fear of God, but here's what I need you to hear this morning, that when Scripture talks about the fear of God, this is not the cowering, terrified response to an abusive father. It is the reverential and respectful response to a loving father. You have had a variety of experiences in your collective life as a church with dad. For some of you, when I say that God is father, you love that image because you had a great earthly dad, and he did good things for you and loved you and cared for you and so you can take the character of your heavenly father and you can see that in your earthly father and that's what we should shoot for but there are many 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 of you who are sitting out here who don't have that experience you had an abusive earthly dad you had a verbally or physically abusive you had an absent earthly dad all of those kinds of things and all of that factors into how you understand god as your father And so I need to say that again. When we talk about the fear of God, 
If you grew up with an abusive father at any level, I need you to understand that when we talk about fearing God, we are talking about something far different from what you experienced as a child. And we are sorry for the way that you were treated. And we feel for the way that you were treated. And God does not condone the way that you were treated. When, when God says to fear him, that's because it's the most healthy, most reverential, most re respectful thing. That it's, it's the best thing that you could possibly do. And so when you hear scripture talk about the fear of God, it's important that we think about healthy reverence, healthy respect. A healthy, respectful fear is important in any good parent-child relationship. I also realize that that may not be the most popular message in parenting in the 21st century, but I want to say it again, that a healthy and respectful fear is important and good in any parent-child relationship. So as a kid, you guys, I'm sure that you look at me and you're like, man, Pastor Steve, good, kind, righteous, holy, probably never, hardly ever sinned as a kid, right? Like, right? Okay, come on, come on. Let me tell you something. I did some bad stuff as a kid. Like, I was a naughty little guy. I, was, I like to say I was busy, right? Back in the day, they said we were bad and we were terrible. We were little hellions. Can I say that from the stage? That's what they called me, so I'll go with it, right? Now we just say, oh, he, he's so busy, right back in the day hellions today busy anyway i refrained from a lot of bad behavior as a child i refrained from a lot of bad behavior as a child not because i was so good and righteous and holy and all that i refrained from a lot of bad behavior as a child because of what resided on top of the refrigerator in the kitchen my dad was a construction worker and carpenter and was really good with tools and he took pride and I think a little too much pride in the handcrafted paddle that he made because my parents took literally that verse in Proverbs that, that says folly is a bound up in the heart of a child but a good whooping will draw it right out of him amen yeah I stand here today as a testament to the validity of that verse but there was a lot of things as a kid, and again, look, I realize and understand that for many of us, that's maybe not a laughing matter because of what you endured as a child, and in no way are we trying to make light of that. But I do want you to see is that as a young man who was prone to sinfulness, very prone to sinfulness, a healthy fear of my earthly father kept me from doing a lot of things that I would have regretted later in life. So as my parents, who weren't always perfect by any stretch, did what God had called them to do at that season in life and to lead and guide and to train and to discipline me, I loved them. I am thankful for them. But there was a level of healthy, respectful fear of the fact that I knew that my father never would, but that if he wanted to, he could put his arm around me and pop my head right off with one with one bicep right and i realized like i was not abused i was not beaten in the wrong way i was not none of those things right but there was a healthy and reverential fear of god which caused me to conduct myself with fear then as a teenager, when I went out into the parking lot at the job where I worked, and I got into the car with my friends, and they opened up the cooler, and they said, here, have whatever you want. And I thought, I'm not 21. I shouldn't have that at all. How did you guys get it? Because you're not 21 either. Right? It wasn't just, I love the Lord, and I am holy, so I must not partake of that, especially before I'm 21. It was, if I drink that and something bad happens, like my mom always tells me, well, I am going to get beat relentlessly, right? I am going to be grounded. I'm going to lose my car. I'm going to lose everything that I own. And I am going to be like 25 years old before I'm let out of the house. There was a fear of what was going to happen, and that was a good thing, and it was an important thing. That's what Peter's talking about. He says, if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with holy, reverential fear throughout the time of your exile. And what I think is important about that exile piece, which Peter keeps coming back to and will come back to again, is this. He's again reminding them, you are temporary residents, right? You are temporary, your sojourners, temporary residents in a place 
where you're spiritual strangers. We talked about that before. And here's what he's telling them. He was encouraging them to fear God more than to fear man. To fear the judgment of God more than to fear man's persecution. When he calls them exiles, he does it on purpose. Because they're in a place in that day, much as we are in this day, where the propensity is to fear man and allow that to move us in whatever direction that man wants us to go. And he says, rather than feeling, fearing man's persecution, well, if I don't like that, I don't watch that, I don't do that, I don't drink that, I don't smoke that, I don't do those things, then people might think I'm weird, or people might think I'm different, or people might make fun of me, or I might not get invited to parties. Instead of fearing man and man's judgment, fear God and God's judgment. That's motivation for Christian living right there, isn't it? So we're motivated, number one, by a reverential fear of God, our Father, and God, our Judge. And then in verses 18 and 19, we're also motivated by a deeper appreciation of our ransom in Jesus. And this is going to get theological, so I'm going to go down here and get a drink, and we're going to have fun. Because we love theology here, don't we? Mm-mm, mm-mm. We love theology here, don't we? Because theology matters. You build your life and your actions on your theology. And so Peter gives us some here. Verse 18. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. There's so much that's right there, but I'll point out a few things. When it says, the first word, when it says knowing, this is a true acknowledgement. This is a true understanding. This is a true appreciation. He's saying we need you to have a true acknowledgement and understanding, a true appreciation for what Jesus has done for you. And the question for us is, do we really know, understand, appreciate what Christ has done for us. And so he'll lay that out in the following verses. And when it says that you were ransomed, it's such a key, important theological word right there. I want to talk about it for just a minute. Some of your translations have ransomed. Some of them have redeemed. And if it has ransomed, the immediate picture that comes to your mind is like, you know, somebody got taken hostage, and then Liam Neeson showed up, and then you had to pay money to get them back or something, right? Only the people down here got that. It's okay, right? Yeah, there's like this whole hostage situation. You have to pay to get the hostage back, and that's what ransom means. And the word redeem has a much deeper, more theological understanding. And what's so beautiful about this first century AD document that we're reading is that there was this like kind of widespread understanding of what this word meant. So there was a a Greco-Roman understanding because these were people that were in that context. There was also a Jewish understanding because a lot of the people that were reading this were Jewish people and they come together to form a beautiful picture. So in the Greco-Roman world, when you were going to be redeemed or ransomed, it was used many ways, but one of the most prominent was for that of a slave who was going to be redeemed or ransomed. And someone could buy that slave's freedom and set them free. But more often what happened is you study it, and this is like really uh, important for our understanding of redemption in the, in the New Testament as a whole, is that the slave himself was provided ways in that culture where they could save money a little bit at a time. And slaves would often save money a little bit at a time and a little bit at a time over years and over maybe even a lifetime that they would save up money and they would then take that money to the temple of one of the pagan gods or goddesses and they would deposit that money in the temple of that pagan god or goddess. And then the slave themselves would stand back And the owner of the slave would come in, and the priest there of that pagan god or goddess would take that ransom money, would pay that owner to buy the uh, freedom of the slave. And what actually happened was was it was seen and understood, not that the slave was buying their ransom, but that the god or goddess, the pagan god or goddess, was actually buying the freedom of the slave. And what that meant is that the slave was then free from its master, but the slave was then slave to that pagan god or goddess. If you go to Romans chapter 6, that's exactly the picture that Paul is talking about when he says that we are no longer slaves to sin, 
but slaves to righteousness. That's the whole picture that he's talking about. And so in the Greco-Roman world, there was this idea and this concept of a God paying for, buying you back from slavery, and then you not being slaves any longer to that owner, but being slaves to that God. And, and Scripture uses that. The New Testament writers use that to help us to understand some of our relationship with God. Then in the Jewish context, you realize that, that this whole idea um, has its roots in, especially in Passover, where God's people were slaves in Exodus, in, in, in Egypt, during the time of the Exodus. And that God, through the whole Passover system, and specifically the Passover lamb, which he will refer to in just a moment, that God bought their freedom through that unblemished lamb and so there's the whole passover concept and the blood of the lamb was brushed on the doorpost and god's people were ransomed as, from sp that slavery and set free um, the biblical imagery when we talk about being ransomed or redeemed has so much to do with like the songs that we sang today i'm no longer a slave to fear i'm no longer a slave to sin I'm no longer a slave to worldliness. We sing songs about our chains being broken, about being set free, about being delivered. That's what's happened to you as a Christian if you've been ransomed. And when Peter says that in that verse, knowing that you were ransomed, that's what he's talking about, that there's a price that has been paid. That there's a price that you have been purchased. That you have been set free. And then he answers the next question, well, what have I been ransomed from? And he says it right there. He says that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. Feudal means empty. It means meaningless. It means worthless. Those ways inherited from your forefathers. And here again, the context is important, the historical context, because there were Jewish people who were listening to this letter and there were Gentile people, Christians, who were listening to this letter as well. For the Gentiles, the feudal ways inherited from their forefathers, that was Gentile paganism, right? That was worshiping false gods, worshiping no god, worshiping themselves, doing all the things that we find in all those crazy lists in the New Testament. That was Gentile paganism. Some of you, God called you out of a lifestyle of paganism, right? Right? You have one of those testimonies that I can't have you share in youth group. That makes sense, right? Some of you have got that testimony, and you know God did amazing things in your life. That God set you free from all of the evil and the bad and the terrible things. That God set you free from that. And so you understand what it means to be free from paganism. If you're concerned about the noise, um, the Holy Ghost is coming upon us. And so for those of you in the back, I can kind of hear it a little bit as well. No, we're, we had to have some emergency roof uh, work done. And so the guys are taking a little break, but then they told me I have to be done at a certain time, and they're going to start working again. So I'm going to talk even faster, and we're going to get it done. I won't do that. This is too good for that. <clears throat> so there was Gentile paganism, but there was also Jewish legalism that some of those readers would have heard and understood and that they had lived in and grown up in this Jewish legalism, this Jewish, like, just do the law for the sake of the law and for many of us maybe God set us free from that right we thought that we were born again before we ever even knew what it meant to not be we thought we were born again because we did all the right things right uh, one of the things that can happen if you're just living like I had said before for the fear of what might happen to you and the consequences you can think that somehow that's where you get your righteousness Probably for most of us in this room, God, God has set us free, like those Jewish people, from legalistic, moralistic righteousness, where we think that we've done it on our own. And so where it says you were set free from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, that's what he's talking about. And some of the things, one of the things we like to see is some of us were ransomed from what we were. Some of us are, have been ransomed from what we could have been, Right? Some of us were ransomed from what we were. Some of us were ransomed from what we could have been. The last piece of this is the most, actually the most important. So what happened? We were ransomed. What were we ransomed from? This worthless, futile life inherited from our forefathers. But here's the biggest question. What did it cost? One of the Puritans said it actually cost God more to redeem us than it did to create us. His name was Thomas Watson. 
He said it costs God more to redeem us than it costs to create us. We can think about that, talk about that over lunch. But what did it cost? The text says, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. And I don't know if you noticed how many of the passage or the songs that we sang today reference the precious blood of Christ and what we have received because of the blood of Christ. That was really cool, and I think probably at least a little bit intentional to get us thinking about it. But here's what I want you to know, and what I want to uh, make real clear, and Pastor Lauren and I both have, have tried to make this clear throughout our teachings here at PCBC. When the Bible talks about the blood of Christ, it is speaking about the whole picture of the death of Christ. It's speaking about the whole picture of what happened on the cross, okay? It, it, was it literal blood that was shed? Absolutely. Hebrews, without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin, okay? We believe that Jesus shed real, physical, actual blood, that that was necessary, that, that was part of the picture, okay? Um, but when Scripture talks about the blood of Christ in most of the passages, it's, talk, it's using metonymy, right? It's using a, a word picture where you take one thing and you use it to mean something really greater and more all-encompassing. And so when it says that you were purchased with the precious blood of Christ, here's what it's talking about. You were purchased with the sacrificial, substitutionary, atoning, propitiatory, justifying, sanctifying, reconciling, redeeming blood of Christ. And if that doesn't get you excited, not much will as a Christian. But some of you are like, were you just speaking English just then? So let me explain a few of them, because this is what I get really excited about. This is where theology meets life. When we talk about the, the sacrificial blood of Christ being spilled, there's an entire Old Testament it helps us to understand that. But when you go to Philippians, you realize that Jesus, being God, took on human flesh, became obedient to death on a cross. And he did that as a sacrifice, as not only any sacrifice, but as the sacrifice to which all the Old Testament sacrifices had pointed forward to. And that there was only one who could make that sacrifice. I couldn't make that sacrifice. You can't make that sacrifice. We couldn't sacrifice for other people. That only God the Son in human flesh who came and took on human flesh and lived a perfect life could make that sacrifice. God sacrificed. And in the Old Testament, you see Abraham and Isaac as a type of that. And you go all the way through and you see so many different types or illustrations of that. But only one sacrifice that God sacrificed. It was substitutionary. That's a long one, right? He died. When I come up here and I say, Jesus died in your place for your sins. That's the substitutionary atonement. That means that he was our substitute, meaning you should have hung on the cross. I should have hung on the cross. Better yet, I, I deserve an eternity separated from God, right? Right? But Jesus substituted himself as the only right substitute, as the only substitute that would matter. I couldn't do it myself. He had to substitute and do it himself. 2 Corinthians 5.21. I have a bookmark there, so I'll go there fast-ish, I think. 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, he, that is God, made him, that is Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's what some of the great reformers called the great exchange, where we got the righteousness of Christ, and he took on our sinfulness, our unholiness. That's substitutionary. Atoning, again, means that there's a price that has to be paid, that your sin, figuratively speaking, was on, is on the altar and something's got to cover that. That's what Leviticus 16, by the way, the Day of Atonement, that's what that whole crazy thing is all about. And all of those sacrifices in the Old Testament is that there was sin, and it had to be covered because the holy God looks and he sees that sin, and somebody's going to die. The only thing that could cover or atone for that sin was the blood of Christ. It's an atoning death. It's propitiatory, which means it satisfies the wrath of God. 
only the blood of Christ, only the sacrifice of Jesus really satisfies the wrath of God. I think we might have heard something about that in one of the songs today. Justifying, meaning that only because of the death and, of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ will God look at you as a Christian and say, righteous. It's where you're declared righteous. To justify means to declare legally, to declare righteous. The blood of Christ, the death of Christ did that for us. It's also sanctifying in that it has set us apart for a life of righteousness. It's reconciling, which means it has reconciled the relationship between man and God. That you can actually have a relationship with God, but only through the blood of Christ. And it's a redeeming death. It's redeeming blood where it has bought you back from slavery to sin and made you a slave to righteousness and to God. We don't have time to turn there, but Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10, I had a bunch of references written down. This is the greatest places in the New Testament to go and to look at what has the blood of Christ purchased for us. And I'll give it to you in two words, forgiveness and access. It's given us forgiveness of our sins and everything that that means. And it's given us access to God the Father through the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Christ is precious, as Peter says, because of what it provides. And I would submit this to you, that maybe sometimes our lack of motivation to live for Jesus is due to an anemic understanding of the death of Jesus. Sometimes our lack of motivation to live for Jesus is the result of a, an anemic understanding of the death of Jesus. Do you understand enough of what Christ has done for you? This is why sometimes we read theology for motivation and we read theology for worship. Because it just gives us a broader picture and a more, greater perspective. One of the greatest books on this topic is called The Atonement. It's meaning and significance. The atonement, it's meaning and significance by a guy named Leon Morris. I think we both had it in seminary. I read part of it again last night just because it's like worshipful to understand what God has done for us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Third and finally, our motivation. In verses 20 and 21, we're going to see that our motivation comes from faith and hope in the sovereign plan of God faith and hope in the sovereign plan of God. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 20. It says, he was foreknown, that's Jesus, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. When it says he was foreknown before the foundation of the world in those verses, that doesn't mean that God looked and was like, oh, I think that's going to happen. It meant that God planned in advance. Your redemption through the blood of Jesus was always part of the divine plan. Your redemption through the blood of Jesus, all of those things that I just unpacked and talked about, about the death of Jesus, that's always been part of the plan of God. This is before the foundation of the world. This was part of God's plan. God knew it was going to happen before, chronologically, before it was even necessary and needed. And I think it's important for us to understand that our faith and our hope are not anchored in fate. They're not anchored in chance. They're not anchored in human ideology or general spirituality. They're anchored in the purposeful and the powerful sovereign plan of God. It says that it was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but it was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, that Jesus came at just the right time in human history, that Jesus came at just the right time in the plan of God. Jesus did just what needed to be done, and it was for the sake of the people that were going to be called God's own. And it says in verse 21, through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. The God who created you, elected you, planned before the creation of the world to redeem you, sent his son to die for you. He did it for the sake of you, and he has a continued plan for you. 
because of what God has done for us in Christ, we can have hope and we can have faith in what he will continue to do. In addition to that, we can have motivation to live for him while we're here. The original readers who were reading this letter were going through persecution. They had been exiled physically. And again, they needed some hope and they needed some motivation. It would have been easy for many of them to assimilate into culture. And he continually pulls them back and says, no, live a holy life before God. But motivation matters. And he's motivated them with three things that should motivate us all. Reverential fear, appreciation of the ransom in Jesus, and hope and faith in God's providential plan. So my hope is that we are a little more motivated to carry out what God has called us to do today, to continue to study his word and continue to live holy lives before him. I'm going to pray. We're going to sing one more song again, and it's a song about theology. It's a song about the things that we believe. Um, because those things drive our action and motivate our lives. So I want you to stand with me, and uh, we're going to pray as the worship team comes. Father, again this morning, we thank you that we can stand here and call you Father and understand that you are not only uh, Father, that you are judge, and that, that as Father, you judge in a loving and a just way. God, I pray that we would fear you in a healthy way. I, fear, I pray that we would be motivated by what Christ has done for us and really come to grips with what Christ has done for us, and that we would continue to trust in your sovereign plan. God, continue where motivation is lacking this morning to give motivation, um, where the gospel is lacking this morning, that you would um, just open someone's heart to receive you. And God, I just pray that as we even sing this last song, that our faith would be strengthened in Jesus' name. Amen.